Thank you, Luca. Nice to see you all. Thanks for coming. Um, yeah, in this age of the World Wide Web, I thought I would focus on things that you can't Google. Although there will be some things you can Google, but um, I'm going to put this in somewhat of a personal perspective um, to, uh, to make it worth your while. And uh, Marvin has had a long career. It's about 60 years now. And uh, we're not going to cover in any amount of level of detail uh, everything that he's done. But I chose some highlights that have been interesting to me and that um, uh, relate in one way or another to his uh, work in AI. So here are some facts you actually can Google. Um, and uh, this gives you a perspective on, on the origins of the man. Um, the uh, motivation for this talk is, of course, his Turing Award, which he got in 1969, probably number 15 or something like that, I think. Uh, I might be wrong about that. Um, but he's still doing research, and he's still giving his lecture that I took at uh, MIT in the spring of 1991. And um, um, his career goes way back to uh, the 50s. Here's a picture of him in the in the early days of the AI lab at MIT. In these days, there was a lot of optimism about AI, and um, people were very excited about the possibilities that this technology would, would bring. And, um, you know, thinking about it historically, I think you know, one of the reasons was, well, now we can see that the brain uh, uses electricity to think, and now we have a machine that allows us to get a handle on or control the flow of electricity. So now, why not just write the program? And it should work, right? Um, so here's a memo from 1971, kind of uh, showing the, the, well, the ambition of, of these people. Uh, this, so the lab was founded, I think, in 69. And so it's, it's a few, it's just a couple of years into it. And, and look at the list that, that's already included in the research topics of the lab. There's robotic vision, mechanical manipulation, advanced automations, model for learning, induction and analogy. Things that actually, frankly, nobody has a clue about still. Um, schemata for organizing large bodies of knowledge, development of, uh, development of hierarchical programming control structures. Well, that, that one is solved. Uh, models of structures involved in common sense thinking. Nobody has a clue. Understanding meanings, especially natural language. Nobody has a clue. Um, computational geometry, well, some clue. Uh, Trade-offs between memory size and parallelism. Nobody really touching that one. Uh, theories of complexities, Ooh, now there's a problem. And so on. Now, um, so that sets the stage kind of for the optimism part of the title of the talk. Um, yes, they were hopeless optimists. Um, he and his friends, who were by no means mental midgets, these are towering figures in the history of computer science, uh, if not AI, although they're more, more associated with AI than anything else, except for Herbert Simon, who got the Nobel Prize in economics. But um, Um, coming back to the context uh, of, of personal experience, I, I would like to show you a video that, uh, where I got to interview Marvin in my first year at MIT. And so this is very, very old, but I find it kind of fun to watch, and I've been looking for a reason to, to show you this. So here it goes.
I'd see the human interface as being uh, any sort of software and or hardware system that uh, mediates between people and artificial devices, whether they would be uh, mechanical devices, uh, physical devices of one kind or another, or software devices. I think that the scope or boundary of the human interface is really the human being, because uh, the limiting factor is our ability to perceive sensory information, uh, to have emotional and cognitive responses to that information. Um, so whether sensory information is being delivered directly to the sense organs or in some way directly to the brain, um, it is the human organism that presents the limit to, to interface technology. What is the scope of the human interface? Well, conventionally, people mean how the person interacts with the environment. But to me, this is an obsolete view because there isn't really any person. There's a collection of computers and processes inside the brain. So the interface between the human and the world is the large bundle of nerves that go down the spinal cord and the 12 pairs of cranial nerves that go to the various sensors and defectors in the head. Uh, given that a uh, human interface deals more and more with increasingly complex systems, uh, whether purely software or hybrids of uh, software and physical systems, there's a problem of complexity. And the problem here is um, to avoid confusing or disorienting uh, a user. The second problem would be the uh, large volumes of data, whether this is in the form of uh, large archives of data, large volumes of image data, or uh, scientific data. One wants to provide a way of navigating through this in a way that is that is uh, physically meaningful. We're doing a pretty good job of uh, understanding where people move in a space and, and what that might mean. Another area that is, I think, going to be an important issue is dealing with information overload. What do we do with um, all the information coming into people and how are we going to be able to uh, provide them some filtering mechanisms and ways in which to uh, attract their attention to the information and uh, information that's uh, necessary for their, their particular uh, task. I have to say that number one at present is uh, speech recognition and natural language understanding. I think that we're doing a good job in, uh, in other areas of, of sensory perception, displays, technology, display technology, animation, et cetera, et cetera. I think it's sort of like back in the Renaissance when all the artists are trying to achieve realism and all the pictures were beautiful and uh, as close to nature as could be. I think that's what's happening right now with ultimate realities and things like that. The future of the human interface research is to recognize that right now everyone's doing childish things of making better pictures for the eyes. Most interfaces, at least up to the present, um, have been direct physical, if not bodily, uh, analogs of the process that was being controlled, such as driving a car, operating consumer devices, and so on. These are generally based quite, quite uh, explicitly on the body and on body motions. But with the kinds of devices becoming very, very abstract, the kinds of interfaces, that one needs become equally abstract and it becomes very difficult then to create and sustain a model for people to use in uh, approaching the interface. I also believe that artificial characters or agents and software will become increasingly important in the near future and we need to do a better job of understanding how to encapsulate certain kinds of knowledge and expertise into 
entities that can be represented to people um, by the computer because this takes advantage of our ability, our social abilities, in, in helping us learn how to use an interface. All previous research, without very many exceptions anyway, have been connecting between the human sensory systems and the muscular systems to find better ways to operate on the world and get information from the world. But you're still always working through these cranial nerves and spinal cords. What I think will happen over the next 50 years is we'll learn more and more about implanting electrodes and other devices that can pick information out of the brain and send information into the brain. And ultimately, that way we can pick up not just the actions people propose to perform, but the intentions that they had in performing them. In order to do that, the interface computer has to become smarter and smarter to anticipate the intentions of the person. And when it becomes smart enough, we won't need the person anymore, and the interface problem will disappear. I have certain misgivings here. I think that there's a tendency to to act out or to explore uh, science fiction ideas uh, regardless of any uh, ethical concerns um, and the, the ultimate is obviously some sort of direct coupling between the nervous system and artificial devices and that frankly makes my blood run cold. Although I think that, that human common sense and good judgment will prevail in the end uh, and maybe we won't really achieve that sort of nightmarish state. Um, in terms of ultimate development, I think that the, the only certain thing that, that can be said is that it's unpredictable. Right, so um, as you could hear in that um, video, um, Minsky has very lofty goals and he still has um, this view that uh, humans will become obsolete. Um, he was a member of the Extropians for, and probably still is, which is a group of people in mainly California, I think, who wants to who want to figure out how to extend our lives indefinitely. Um, but we won't have time to go into that too much. Uh, I want to talk uh, more about um, the uh, idea of the intelligent machine because this is, of course, the main running theme throughout his uh, research. And I took the liberty of boiling his view down to essentially this, that thinking is the result of symbol manipulation. It is what people have, many have thought in AI uh, since the very early days, um, especially um, Alan Newell and uh, Herbert Simon were big proponents of this. Uh, and, um, and Minsky essentially uh, detests any work that involves trying to model neurons in the field of AI. Now, he doesn't necessarily judge neuronal research as such, but as a means to an end of intelligent machines. Um, this is a running theme. And so I wanted to show you a couple of snippets. He's written a number of, of uh, essays and, and, of course, books, which we'll um, talk about a little bit as well. But um, one, especially, two or so of his short stories are extremely entertaining. And in fact, they encapsulate so much of his, both his character and his views that I couldn't resist uh, showing you a couple. It's, uh, I apologize to those who have already read this, but probably it was a while ago, so it's okay to, to review. So here's uh, this story uh, 
I think appeared in Discover magazine. Uh, the premise is this, two interstellar aliens have come to assess the life forms on, on Earth. The human life forms will be entitled to rights if the aliens can conclude that they think. Most such decisions are easy to make, but this case is unusual. And the aliens are, there's an apprentice and there's a surveyor. So the apprentice keeps asking questions. One of them is, why are these humans so quarrelsome? Even their so-called entertainments are mostly fights disguised as plays and games and sports. Surveyor, this is because they were never designed. They evolved by competing with tooth and claw. Evolution on Earth is still mainly based on the competition of separate genes. Here's a bit further down in the story. Surely, though, we must regard them as intelligent. Despite their faults, they've already built some simple computers, and I've overheard them arguing about whether machines could ever think. Huh. It's our job to find out if they can think, but I'll grant that it's amazing how much they can do, considering that their brain cells compute only a few hundred steps per second. And yet, in spite of this, the apprentice says, uh, they can still recognize a friend in less than half a second or understand a language phrase or notice that a shoe is untied. How can they react so rapidly when their internal components are so slow? Um, a little bit further down, are you suggesting that the more parallel operations are used in a machine, the more serial it will see from the outside? I could not have said it more clearly myself. To see why, suppose that a certain task involves two different kinds of sub-jobs. If we want them uh, if we want to do them simultaneously, we'll have to run their programs and their data in two separate places to keep them from interfering with each other. Similarly, if, we cho if uh, each of those jobs splits into sub-jobs, those must each be solved with only a quarter of the available resources, and so on. Total fragmentation. Eventually, the sub-sub-sub-jobs will end up with no place to work. A purely parallel machine must split, must stop at some limit of complexity, whereas a serial computer will simply slow down. That's funny, says the apprentice. Most of the computer experts on Earth seem to think that parallel and distributed go together. Um, there's more, and this is funny. But language isn't everything. Shouldn't we give them credit for explaining things with pictures too? They do seem to have excellent senses. That was my first impression too until I saw their TV sets usually only have three electron guns. Of course, this means that they're virtually blind. <laughs> I tried to shorten this, but it's, it's hard to actually without losing the point. And here's the last one. Uh, some of their books do embody significant knowledge. Most of them are, a little, are little more than sequences of fictional anecdotes about conflicts involving what they would call love and lust, ambition and greed, harmony and jealousy. Their so-called novels aren't novel at all, but mere permutations of those elements. The trouble is that their time sequential languages force them to squeeze their parallel structures through narrow band serial channels. Serial communication? They seem to have everything upside down. Thinking, of course, should be serial, and communication should be parallel. But how then do they convert those sequences, etc.? So anyway, uh, it's a very entertaining read. Um, so one of the things that you take away, <clears throat> especially if you read those stories more than once, is that Marvin is a really smart guy, and he can boil things down to very simple uh, bullet points that ca and, and encapsulate uh, very complex ideas in, in a single paragraph or even a sentence. Um, <clears throat> another paper or another um, uh, publication of his was uh, a tech report at the AI lab uh, titled A Framework for Representing Knowledge. And this uh, this paper has been uh, hugely influential and probably is uh, at least one of the reasons why object-oriented programming took off. Um, but basically, he proposed to that knowledge would, should be represented uh, in a frame where the slots are either links to other frames or some sort of a semantic node that contains information. And a network of these will essentially encapsulate the, or, or capture the relationships of things in the world. Um, another publication of his is uh, the book that he wrote with Seymour Papert called Perceptrons. Now, a perceptron uh, is a device that was invented by a psychologist named Frank Rosenblatt 
who was really interested in how the brain works. And it's essentially the first mechanization of learning by trial and error. Um, the book Perceptrons came out in 69 and an updated version uh, with handwritten annotations, which, is, which are very entertaining to read in 1987. And there, um, Minsky, uh, Minsky and, and Pappard essentially uh, completely shoot down the perceptron as, a, as, a, as an idea of interest to the AI community because uh, in a network like this, you cannot have it learn XOR or the inverse of XOR, not XOR. And uh, interestingly enough, this book, although probably both authors knew that you could have more layers, this had a chilling effect on funding in AI for a long time, maybe 10, 15 years, where anyone working on uh, ANNs would have a hard time getting real funding. I'm not sure how um, far this extended outside of the US, but certainly at this time, the main, the bulk of AI research was in the US. Of course, the solution is this. It's very simple. Add more layers. You can have actually uh, as many layers as you want, but it gets inefficient and probably redundant pretty quickly. Now, the current models of artificial neural networks have recurrences in them and are much, much, much more complex than, than this could ever uh, be said to be. But, um, and they're doing amazing things. But as we'll get to a bit later, um, I still uh, am partial to, to Minsky's argument that you uh, really aren't going to get very far, or at least not very quickly, if you want to do AI with neuron models. So here's the big question that, that Marvin always comes back to. And, and it, it's the theme of pretty much every single talk that, he's, that I've ever seen, at least of his, and I've seen many. Um, there, it's not just, in, it's not uh, informative. It's uh, so entertaining to watch him, because you can, it's almost like you can see, he, he's a really bad pre preparer of talks. So you can sort of see him preparing in his head as he's talking. And uh, it makes for an exciting experience, usually. Uh, so this is, this is the, the, his big question. And, and he keeps, throughout his career, pointing people back to this question. Um, and the main contributions to this effort are his uh, Society of Mind book and The Emotion Machine, which came out in 2007. Um, the basic theory is like this. And since this is the bulk of, of his, it's, a, essentially, it's essentially a summary of everything that he's uh, been looking at over the years and decades. And um, I wanted to go through a couple of things here. Let's see, should be halfway through, yeah. Um, to just give those who, who are not in, in the field of AI or are in the field of AI but haven't really looked at Mansky's ideas, just to give you a glimpse of, of this. So the basic theory is, is, you know, lies in the title. Society of mind, the mind is like a society. What, of society of what? Of agents. Now, uh, you can you can read online why he chose that term. It's been abused, used and abused ever since, but or and even possibly possibly before. But the idea is this: the functions of the brain are the products of the work of thousands of different specialized subsystems, and we cannot hope to understand any of this through the same methods that particle physicists look for the simplest possifying uni uh, possible unifying conceptions. I guess this is, this is where his views and mine are completely in alignment. Uh, and probably th this is where I learned it. Constructing a mind is simply a different kind of problem. And this is why I almost always in my talks talk about uh, methodology and the fact that we should not look for uh, a single unifying concept or the, the golden screw or whatever you call it uh, to construct intelligence in a machine. So here's what he says about that. 
Both my collaborators, Seymour Papert and I, had long desired to combine a mechanical hand, a television eye, and a computer into a robot that could build with children's building blocks. You can tell that it is old text because you know you wouldn't say television now. It's like you use monitor, of course, but it's so funny how things change. Okay, it took several years for us and our students to develop Move, See, Grasp, and hundreds of other little programs we needed to make a working builder agency. It was this body of experience, more than anything we'd learned about psychology, that led us to the idea of societies of mind. Um, and I should note here for the ICTCS crowd that um, here's uh, uh, where a branch happens and Carl Hewitt took the ideas of actors um, into a computational model of concurrency, which has then, of course, grown and changed and modified. And probably he wasn't alone, but this is a fairly incestuous crowd there at MIT, so they tend to cite each other a lot. Um, now, wouldn't this lead to a problem where you know, you're just explaining how an agent, a human, does stuff by saying, oh, there's a bunch of agents, so you now have to explain those, and so on and so on at an infinitum. No, because each level down, the agents are dumber. It's the group behavior of them that produces the next level up of intelligence, if you will. Um, the Society of Mind is a very interesting book in many ways. One of them is that it's written in small chapters. Each page has a chapter, and they're not, he doesn't make any effort to connect them. So it's kind of um, justifiable because obviously, you know, he doesn't have the final solution. He's not explaining, you know, here's how you do AI, period. Uh, here are some very good ideas, is essentially what he's saying. But it's also frustrating because it makes it obvious how vast the problem is and how difficult it will be to connect all of these things. But some of the ideas that he presents that are new in, uh, in the book, well, you will find analogies of these concepts to uh, standard computer science concepts, but there will always be some sort of a, uh, a, a some difference, some little delta or big de delta that, that will make it, uh, that will justify giving it a different name. So K-lines um, is essentially um, a, what he calls the on-off switches of agents, essentially. Gnomes and Neems are ge two general classes of K-lines, analogous to the data and control lines in uh, in uh, digital computers. Isonomes signal to different agencies to perform the same uniform type of cognitive operation. This is, you know, uh, uh, well, anyway. Um, pronomes uh, are isonomes that control the use of short-term memory, etc. He has a, a bunch of diagrams for explaining how these relate to each other as well as the text. But, um, and, and there's more. But one of the problems with this uh, way of presenting uh, these ideas is that it doesn't go into enough detail to really get people motivated to start to try to implement it. There's so many things that, are, that lie unanswered. Now, what, uh, a footnote here is one of his ideas, the A brains and the B brains, which I found fascinating when he first, first started telling us about it in his Society of Mind class, it turns out that in, the, in our Human Ops project, we have essentially reinvented this, and we don't call it A-brains and B-brains, but it's exactly that. Um, it's the idea of a learner and a meta-learner. Not a new idea, but um, you know, in, the, in the late 80s, you didn't see much mention of that. So the Society of Mind course is a course that he gives uh, at MIT every other year. Um, it's open to all MIT students, but he handpicks who gets to sit in on it. And um, the first, first half of each class, he, he's basically uh, lecturing, telling you about some set of concepts. And the second half, the students get to ask questions. Um, and the final project, uh, or the, the uh, assignments in this is one final project and two small essays, at least when I took it. 
he gives you a long list. It's like four times this length of questions that he's collected over the years. And frankly, I think this was one of the more valuable things that uh, I took from this class. Uh, because I, didn't, I hadn't ever seen this before. I had never seen a teacher basically bring questions. You know, you, you go to a class, you, the teacher's always giving you answers. And so here was like the, a core part of this course is questions. And it really made it different. And it also was, of course, a big motivator for, for us to think long and hard about things. And you'll notice, uh, you know, there's mentionings of music quite a bit here. And like so many mathematicians and CS people, uh, Minsky is actually a piano player. He's uh, quite a musician. I once was at a conference in Pittsburgh and uh, noticed some, in the break, some piano tunes flying through the air. And I, I looked over to the, at the grand piano and there's Minsky sitting, improvising, somewhat improvising. It was sort of like half premeditated, I guess. Now, this is a picture of a Bösendorfer, and I'm sure that Minsky is one of the reasons why there was a hundred grand grand at the Media Lab when I was studying there. In fact, uh, Minsky did um, some stuff in the early days. He invented in, in the field of music, he invented something called the Muse Sequencer. It's a very odd looking piece of equipment. And in fact, it's uh, based on a principle, actually I came across it, I didn't know about this uh, until recently, and I came across this on the web. Um, I think it has the ability to produce some four trillion different sets of, of uh, melody lines. And you do it by sliding those sliders, uh, which have 40 positions. And uh, there's a theme control, uh, their tempo, pitch, etc. And in fact, there is a, uh, an emulator that you can play with on, that I found on SoundCloud. It just seems, you know, yeah, OK, four trillion uh, melodies. Uh, are any of them interesting? <laughs> I have a hard time believing that. But yeah, uh, it can play, if it plays sort of a, in the normal tempo, you can have this thing going for years on end before it starts repeating itself. And, yeah, and here's the cool thing, it shipped with a connecting cable that if you bought another one of these, you could hook them up together so they would essentially be synchronized. You know, that would, I guess, extend it to decades. Uh, but after listening to that emulator, I don't, yeah. You'd have to be a robot to really do that. So my, one of my assignments in this class was, why do we like music and why do we get bored with it? And I proposed in this thing that, in this paper that we listen to music. Um, as we listen to music, we predict what's gonna happen next. And once we get good at predicting, you know, based on our own understanding of music, uh, when it stops surprising us, we get bored with it. And he said something like, good idea, in his commentary. And I thought first that he was making fun of me, because uh, here's this genius, and you know, I'm just writing a term paper. But it was pretty, uh, it was pretty nice, nice of him. Now, the reason that, that I was so skeptical that he could actually be positive towards an idea of a very young student there was, that he already had a reputation for being the grumpy old man of AI. And part of it was based on the fact that uh, his main mode of communication is essentially telling you what's wrong with what you're doing, especially in his talks. Um, and he's very uh, brutal to anyone who, who uh, asks the wrong question at his talks. Um, but some of the things he's criticized through the ages is, you know, the strong emphasis on robotics. He says, better to use simulations because, as I remember him wording it, you spend students' time on holding how to hold a soldering iron when they should be studying 
AI. And it's true if you ever try to build a robot, even from pre, uh, prefabricated parts, it's an enormously difficult thing and it takes a long time. Um, so yeah, I, I completely agree with him there. Lack of focus on common sense in AI research. Well, I kind of tend to agree to, to an extent, but basically um, the way that his understanding or at least his implementation of the concept of common sense in his students' work seems very antiquated to me. And well, if time is, is any judge here, it doesn't really work. But they're still doing it. Um, and then, of course, his, his really hatred for anything but symbolic computation for getting AI to work. Yeah, um, I think there's something to that. Frankly, uh, you know, I think the time delay you will introduce if you decide to pick a neuron as your basic Lego block, um, as opposed to to say something that is bigger than like th than that, like a symbol, however you define it, is sort of like saying, well, we're going to build skyscrapers, and we're going to use grains of sand. And well, uh, scaffolding hasn't been invented, and steel rods haven't been invented, and elevators haven't been invented, etc. It's, it's just crazy. So. Um, I was at a talk in 2006 in Germany where they were celebrating 50 years of AI and Minsky was doing his typical telling how everyone was doing it wrong and how nothing would work if, if they did it that way, etc. And it's always fun to listen to him. And um, he was nice enough to, to chat with me afterwards, but actually um, that, that event became one of the times when, he, when I became the target of his anger uh, or grumpiness. <laughs> and uh, because, as he said, my question was obviously irrelevant and very ill-formulated. <laughs> so um, I won't go into details on my question. I have still haven't changed my mind, but I tend to agree with him. I should have thought better about the formula, how to formulate the, the question before I asked. Um, so what has Marvin taught me? Well, actually, it turns out it's good to have heroes, um, even if you later find out uh, that nobody's perfect. Um, what is understanding? This is an incredibly difficult question, but I do understand it now, thanks to Marvin. Um, and he also taught me that it's okay to think about stuff that nobody else is thinking about. Um, this is a very important skill for any scientist. Being brilliant is not enough to be a good scientist, possibly not even necessary. And being rude, aggressive, or generally abrasive, while it's common in the AI circles, does not really help your career. You may think so, based on the behavior of some people. And uh, another thing that I've thought about so many times since he said it in, in the spring of 91, um, all you can hope for as a scientist is to have one good idea per decade. If you can do that, you are on, on a good track. And actually, yeah, I think it's a very strong point. So just to summarize, uh, actually, I have... Just a few slides I want to show you before we quit, but um, a very quick summary. Where's, where does society of mind stand? Well, there are several challenges that nobody has addressed, and Marvin ha seems to have fewer and fewer students every year. And uh, it's a long list. I mean, these are just a few of them. I think maybe one of the main ones is that nobody has really implemented the society or a society of mind model. Or, on the flip side, a lot of people have, in fact, and you still have all these problems. It's like there's so many big missing ingredients that, um, yeah, uh, certainly doesn't seem to justify the harshness with which he criticizes others. Um, and then, of course, you know, 
I don't want you to come away with thinking that uh, my view of him is like uh, that has pretty much been uh, a negative thing. Of course, this this man is a genius, uh, and I saw so many examples of that in the class that I took, and and of course in his talks. It's such a joy to watch someone uh, with this kind of uh, mental clarity uh, and inspiring. And you can see his, of course, long list of accomplishments uh, prove that. Uh, one thing at the very end that he told us about in, in class, and I was a huge fan of this movie, and I had no idea that he was a consultant on this movie. But uh, apparently, uncredited, in fact, uh, Kubrick actually left out a huge list of, of credits that he just said, well, it's not going to be in there. And Minsky should have been one of them, because Minsky actually uh, designed the grippers for the pod. And you can buy them as a model. I even saw that there's a Lego version, which is pretty cool. So that's it. Thank you.